Hello, this is uh, Barry Shaw, The View from Israel. Now, those of you who have been following my video travels throughout Europe, exploring the root causes of the social fragmentation of European countries, bringing with it the consequential rise of anti-Semitism and its effect on the attitudes against Israel, both at street level, at the academic level, and also at government level, will have been impressed by the same phenomena repeating itself wherever I go. And I want to thank all of you who contacted me as a result of the video and my conversations I had with my special guest in, uh, in Sweden last time. And your comments and experiences simply add and impact the conclusions of my research. Now, today, I want to get the views of a non-Jewish political scientist, um, as opposed to uh, the lady I spoke to, uh, uh, who was the head of the WITSO in Sweden. Uh, someone with a background in, in Swedish intelligence, someone who was intimately involved in left-wing politics, a personal involvement at the political life uh, of the country, to share with me his perspectives, which will maybe rid me of some of my uh, conceptions, or will he, in fact, solidify my conclusions about the state of Sweden and the direction it's taking? Johan Westerholm has written about his concerns for Sweden. He's also authored a book about Islamism in Sweden and of all things, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood in Sweden. Johan Westerholm was awarded this year with the Civil Rights uh, a, a Prize established by the civil rights movements in Sweden. Uh, Johan Westerholm, welcome to the show. Thank you, Barry. Uh, what surprised me about your bio, Johan, was that you were a member of the Social Democratic Workers' Party. And it seems to me that in Sweden, the Social Democrats are very similar to the British Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn, very much on the far left, and also in collusion with the Islamists who hate Israel, um, and both were vehemently anti-Semitic. And to cement the relationship at the Labour Party annual conferences, the Palestinian flag filled the rooms of the Labour Party annual conference, no union jacks there, when Corbyn was the head of the party. Now, tell me a bit about the move, your move from the Social Democrat Party to where you are today. Actually, uh, uh, I entered the party in the, the beginning of the, uh, uh, this uh, century. Uh, after leaving uh, the uh, the intelligence service for good, then I uh, figured that uh, I, I might be uh, be able to to be a part of uh, trying to change the society. And uh, the only uh, way to change the society is from within, uh, from the inside of a party. And I, what you can call me, I am an old school social democrat, uh, more like. Swedish politician Torge Lander, who, who has who had a very very close relationship to the state of Israel, and, and identified himself as a friend of Israel, and, and uh, Mr. Joram Parson, who was a really a, a good a big friend of the state of Israel, and, and uh, he was actually one of the founding fathers of the International Holocaust Remembrance Center, and that's that's what my kind of social. Democracy, actually, and uh, then I entered the party, and, and I, I, in 2019, I finally gave up. Actually, I, I'm still a social democrat, but uh, I haven't changed. But the party has changed to a more pro-Islamistic and pro-Palestinian and pro-Hamas uh, uh, kind of policy. Uh, so, so uh, in 2019, I just gave up and I wrote uh, my book about uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Islamism in Sweden, where, where too sadly, actually, uh, the Social Democratic Party uh, has been one of the enablers, so to say, for, for the Muslim Brotherhood to, to, to establish themselves in Sweden uh, in, in such a uh, great manner, actually. Uh, and that uh, they are uh, having a big impact on uh, Swedish politics in general and the Social Democrat, uh, and not to mention the Greens uh, in particular. So that, that's actually my 
sort of say, uh, sort of say uh, my how I developed over the years. Uh, and th this is the short version. Yeah, and um, before we come on to what I call the Red Green Alliance, let's just discuss uh, the Nordic resistance movement. Because in Sweden, this Nordic resistance movement is considered by many as a neo-Nazi party that targets Jews. I mean, for instance, there have been um, demonstrations by these people uh, targeted Jews on Yom Kippur. Uh, they clearly want to rid uh, Sweden of its Jews, which is uh, strange, really, because I think the uh, number of Jews in Sweden is probably less than 29,000. And virtually all of them are fully integrated and assimilated and feel themselves to be native Swedes at the time, uh, which may not be true of the same of the uh, a lot of the migrants that have come here. But anyway, that's one thing. But it, I understand that the Nordic resistance movement has now registered itself as a political party in uh, in Sweden, and it has growing links with the centre-right Swedish Democrats. Um, so, um, how how would you how would you uh, rate the uh, the standing or legitimacy of uh, the Nor the Nordic resistance movement, which is a Scandinavian one, but so far as the Swedish branch is concerned, in mainstream politics in Sweden? I I think that the the, the Nordic uh, resistance movement uh, has a. a Fairly low impact on politics. Actually, they are uh, the secret service or the, the, the security police. They say, they say that there's a roughly one thousand plus minus two hundred maybe uh, uh, par, uh, active uh, participants in in the movement, and they are well known uh, on the political level. They have. Not so much impact, uh, of course, uh, through the Swedish uh, Sweden Demo uh, Sverige Demokraterna, uh, this center right nationalistic party we have in uh, the parliament. Uh, but they're fairly well known. Uh, the problem with the resistance movement, they are they have very very close to violence. Actually, uh, I have um, uh, as a journalist, I. I um, made an investigation on them, and I can say I can tell you this: that this uh, lot, uh, the neo-Nazi lot, they are really, really close to violence. Uh, that was one of the uh, not scary, but but unpleasant experiences uh, that I've had uh, the recent years, having threats uh, put on me and uh, pictures of weapons, and uh, that, that you should look. Uh, you should uh, uh, watch your back and uh, and uh, so forth. So, uh, but they're around thousand, but they're very very close to violence, uh, domestic violence actually. Um, on the other side, we have the Islamistic movements, and they are not close to um, that close to domestic violence at all. Uh, on the contrary, actually, they, they are not interested in in, in uh, Using violence as a political method or a political tool in Sweden, uh, they, but they are recruiting and they're inspiring uh, youngsters to, to to enroll in the Islamic State. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had big problems with that, but they're not at all uh, close to violence in that sense. But nevertheless, they are, according to my in my point of view, they are a greater threat to Swedish democracy and European stability. Uh, than, than the Nordic resistance movement. That's my opinion. And uh, uh, I would say that the French legislation and the German legislation, they are really addressing this kind of threat in, an, uh, in a very, very effective way. But we are not in Sweden. Um, tell me then, um, should, for instance, the centre-right Swedish Democrats uh, come to power in uh, Sweden, what would you consider the influence of the Nordic resistance movement be in that party? Would, it, would you think that their influence would uh, take that sense of right party more to the far right? Or, or isn't that influence that strong politically in Sweden? I would say the Nordic resistance movement, uh, I think uh, they are so unpopular uh, in, in a popular vote. 
So the Sweden Democrats, uh, those in the Sweden de- Democrats who have sympathies uh, with the, the national uh, resistance movement, uh, well, they are smart enough not to to to, to uh, push uh, their agenda, so to say. Um, I would uh, I would say. Well, you can trace it, but I don't think it will have any uh, more measurable impact, actually. Okay, so Johan, tell me about that poster behind you. And while you're doing it, tell me about the symbiotic link between the Social Democrats, the left-wing parties in Sweden, and the growing radical Muslim and Islamists in Sweden. Actually, the poster behind me is the cover of my book, uh, The Islamism in Sweden, uh, which uh, looks like this. It's translated in Norwegian, and uh, it has also a French uh, translation, and I'm working on an English translation. Um, it, uh, it, it's about, it, it, it describes, actually, the links between uh, the Islamistic uh, ideology, I would say. Uh, Islamism has very, very little to do with Islam as a religion, uh, from my point of view. Uh, Islamism is actually an ideology with the roots in the uh, uh, the 30s, uh, connections with the uh, Nazi party, the German Nazi party, and after uh, the war, in 1960s, it, they started to, to uh, collaborate with, with uh, uh, East Germany, uh, the Soviet Union, and they were inspired by this post-Marxist movement. So that's uh, why we have the, the uh, serpent, the star, the, and the, the hammer, and uh, on, on the uh, on the background of. Uh, what uh, the colors of most uh, uh, Arabic states' uh, flags, and the red, of course, symbolizing the, the communist roots, actually. And, uh, that, and I, uh, I use the same uh, colors, actually. Uh, the, ba- the, the base for the, for the poster is that uh, we're using the black, the white, and the red. And then the green came as a symbol for the, for Islam or Islamist or Islam as, a, as actually a, one of the ideologies uh, forming Islamism. And the, the, but the red, the white, uh, uh, the black is actually the, the really really strong. And Adolf Hitler and Joseph Goebbels used those colors when, when communicating uh, the Nazi ideology. It's strong for the eye and uh, raises emotions. So that's the the poster behind it. It's the cover of my my book, actually. Not not having uh, read the book, I, I I don't know where you stand on this because my research shows me that in fact the coalition that you have, what I call the Red Green Alliance between the uh, far left uh, Marxists of any uh, Western government and the uh, the rise of Islamism. Uh, that has been a result of uh, the mass migration from the Middle East is an alliance where they, both of them together with their different causes, are really there in order to bring down the traditional democratic values of Western countries and replace it, well, with what? Because at the end of the day, there is no alliance between Marxism, communism on the one hand, and the hegemony jihadi aim of Islamists. So although they cooperate right now, it is basically into destroy and disrupt uh, uh, democratic uh, traditions of the West. We even see this quite frankly played out in the United States within the Democrat party today. But uh, do you find that this sort of symbiotic uh, unholy alliance taking place and growing in Sweden right now? Uh, very, very much so. Uh, I, I would say both the far left movement and the, the Islamist movement, they are uh, very, very heavily inspired by Franz Fanon, uh, the Algerian uh, uh, political theorist. Uh, and uh, actually, the letters uh, the, between the Franz Fanon and Ali Shariati in the beginning of the 60s 
Um, and uh, it led to uh, one example uh, what, uh, that uh, formed. It, it was the ide- ideology uh, that actually uh, led to the Iranian Revolution uh, in 1979. Uh, Ali Shariati is described as the architect of the Iranian uh, Revolution. Uh, but on the other hand, this Franz Fanon, he also ex- inspired the, the 68 student uh, movement. And um, the student riots in Paris, 1968, and in particular, the, the world, uh, uh, the, the, the conference, the world, world Church's conference in, in Uppsala in Sweden in 1968. Uh, that's where the far left got into religion, got into the Swedish church, and somewhat started to attract the Islamistic movement. So, so right now we have what you say, is this unholy alliance between Islamists, Christian, on the very, very far left in Sweden uh, and in Norway. Actually, no, I've been studying Norway for, for, for uh, some reason, some of them obvious and some not, and uh, uh, that the Islamist movement, because the, the, this from Fanon, he also inspired uh, the post-colonial uh, 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 parts of the Islamistic movement, and very, very much, he, uh, uh, his theories uh, uh, actually um, co- uh, and, uh, completed the theories of uh, Hassan al-Banna and the Grand Mufti of, of Jerusalem, uh, and their opinion about the, the, the right for uh, the state of Israel to exist as a natural home for the Jews, and also um, how they look upon violence as a political tool. Um, we, uh, I can say that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, they cooperated with Adolf Hitler during the Holocaust and, and the Second World War, and out of the ruins of, uh, from the ruins uh, of the Second World War and the, the Holocaust, only one movement survived, and it was the Muslim Brotherhood. Now we can see, we can experience a political power, a political movement, which Europe has never seen before, where we have an uh, uh, extension rebellion, we have uh, other groups on the far left, and we have Islamist movements uh, actually collaborating and cooperating and we can see it as a result, one of the uh, results I've found is that the riots in the Gothenburg, the top meeting, top level meeting, where, where George W. Bush, the president of the United States, had a meeting with the Swedish prime minister, uh, Mr. Jorgen Persson, and we had riots in Gothenburg we'd never seen before. And uh, um, the, the official investigation, they never actually concluded what, what, what was the roots of these, uh, uh, of these riots and, and insurgencies and, and how did it come to this and why did we have the uh, Palestinian uh, uh, support groups cooperating with, with uh, the extreme environmentalists. And they, never, they didn't really see that coming and they didn't really not even in, our, uh, in in the later analysis that they found uh, found that natural in any way. But in my research, I found their own uh, far left the, the far left's own analysis of, of the Gothenburg riots in 2001, and it's written uh, mainly by by a German citizen. His name is Tatsu Müller. And he wrote a report in 2004, and he actually uh, concluded that uh, the, the riots in 2001 uh, was a great success because it was the first time all these independent groups, some coming from the Muslim Brotherhood cluster, and some from the, the environmental cluster, and some from the clusters from the far left, it was the first time where they cooperated, actually. Yeah, I was intrigued actually by um, a. I looked it up after I uh, noticed you'd uh, written about it. The connection between the, which I found absolutely staggering, between the Muslim Brotherhood and the connection to the Swedish Church. And I read of somebody um, called Archbishop Anchi Jacqueline. I don't know if I pronounced the name right, but what could you tell me about this particular Archbishop? Uh, she's 
uh, Auntie Jacqueline, you pronounce it uh, really, really well. Uh, Auntie Jacqueline, she's born in uh, Germany. Uh, uh, and her, uh, she has a background as a professor uh, in the United States after she uh, was appointed to be a priest. But she has a background living in the cluster of the former uh, East Germany, uh, Deutsche Demokratische Republik. And uh, her husband was one an informant to the Stasi. And uh, she has uh, uh, very, very clearly uh, been on the Marxist side, uh, opinion-wise. And her research points out that she is she has sympathies uh, with, with a, uh, on the Marxist side. And the one who appointed her uh, priest, actually, uh, in the, I think, in the 70s or 80s, early 80s, uh, uh, was then a chairman for, for the uh, friendship alliance uh, between uh, Sweden and uh, uh, East Germany. Uh, it was he was the bishop in Stockholm who appointed her uh, as a priest. So she has this very strong linking uh, historically, uh, and I, I would say that she's not the main the, the, the main uh, person responsible for for the development of the Swedish Church. It's one of her predecessors, uh, the former Archbishop Kg Hammar, K. G. Hammar, and he, he because he really pointed out this direction for, for the Swedish church, uh, how, how how to develop the Swedish church. And, um, well, uh, clearly a, a left-wing uh, development, and I would recommend you to, to interview Mr. Johansson Dean, associate professor. Uh, he has written a book about this development, actually, of all the Swedish church, where you have clearly... Uh, um, uh, left-wing opinions, how to interpret it. Uh, the Bible, for example. We have one bishop in the middle of Sweden, we had, he, he's emeritus right now, he uh, got into retirement. But uh, many years ago, he said that, well, uh, the way to paradise, to all Christians' paradise or heaven, uh, the Chinese Cultural Revolution shows us the way. And he then got uh, to be a bishop uh, in the Swedish church. So we have this clearly left-wing sympathies. Uh, they try to interpret the Bible uh, from a left-wing post-Marxist uh, perspective, and uh, with that, uh, it, uh, and with that, it, it quite naturally follows the sympathies of the BDS movement, uh, the, the sympathies of, of the Kairos uh, Declaration. Uh, you have uh, other uh, movements or clusters uh, moving in, in, into this uh, in this direction, actually. And it's a, it's a, I consider it a, it is a big problem for for Sweden right now. Uh, maybe fifty percent of Swedes are ma still members of, of the Swedish Church, and uh, they they have a really really great impact on uh, Swedish opinions and Swedish lives and so forth. Uh, I have left the Swedish Church since, since many years, just uh, as an effect of this. Well, I'll tell you, Johan, how I answered this, because I had to confront this several years ago, um, because uh, this archbishop and people like her uh, represent what's called replacement theology. They belong to a, mm -hmm. a, a branch of Christianity, which, uh, which they feel they have to replace the Jew, um, based on their uh, misconception, I would put it, of uh, biblical uh, renderings. Um, and they so detest Judaism out of a, 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 a desire of this that we had, a, we had, used to have, it's not going on any longer, several years, every year at Christmas time, and we're coming into Christmas periods right now in Bethlehem of all places. There used to be a conference over there based on the Kairos uh, doctrine. Uh, in which um, uh, Christians, like, for instance, your archbishop and maybe certain members of other uh, Jewish Christian uh, churches, uh, came together with the Palestinians and had an, uh, an absurd event in Bethlehem at Christmas time called Christ at the Checkpoint, 
they in fact um, replace the image of uh, Jesus into a Palestinian refugee. Uh, they seem to have forgotten the founding faith of uh, Jesus in the what I call the faithless message, which is ridiculous, basically, because Bethlehem is one of the places that they call occupied, but in fact, Israel left Bethlehem, gave it, if you like, to the, uh, the Palestinians to run. And since then, uh, Bethlehem has been one of the centers of Palestinian terrorism. They used to come out of Bethlehem, and the distance, if you know it, isn't very far to Jerusalem, or even from uh, Kiryat Arba, where they per perpetrated the most ghastly terror events, meaning Israel had to put up some security fence as they left the areas that uh, Israel had given to the Palestinians in order to protect ourselves from people like gunmen and uh, uh, Palestinian uh, suicide bombers. But the last point that you could use, by the way, happened just uh, last week. Um, in which Sweden was one of the countries that voted and supported for a United Nations General Assembly resolution which designated the Temple Mount in the heart of Jerusalem as an exclusively Muslim holy place. Now, I would have thought any archbishop would have been in uproar against the Swedish government voting for some resolution. But it seems you have some Christian leaders who would accept that in their pursuit of lining up with the Palestinians against Israel, the Jewish state. There is an insanity there. Maybe you can explain it because I quite frankly can't. Uh, well, this, this resolution actually, it, it is uh, quite natural. Uh, I wasn't surprised at all, actually. Disappointed, of course, but not surprised. Um, the Archbishop uh, is very, very closely linked uh, uh, to uh, former uh, Secretary of State or Foreign Minister, uh, Ms. Margot Wallström. Uh, Ms. Margot Wallström, as probably most of your uh, this channel's viewers know, she got uh, the... the Simon Wiesenthal Center appointment for, uh, quote, having the eighth uh, worst uh, anti-Semitic quote in 2019 or 2018, uh, when, she, when she, she actually accused Israel, the state of Israel, for performing uh, extrajudicial uh, 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 killings, actually, or, or, or something like that. And she has, uh, Ms. Margaret Rauschen, she's very, very close to, to Palestinian Authority and uh, Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, uh, close relationship, actually, uh, close, uh, friendly, uh, uh, they're close friends. And she, Ms. Margaret Rauschen is actually seen on several pictures, and she has a, a very, very heavy engagement in the Swedish church, where uh, Ms. Margaret Rauschen and Antje Jakelian, they are considered to be very, very close friends. Uh, so I would say that... Um, uh, uh, you, uh, you talk about uh, this, what, what, what uh, the Swedish has uh, now as a new uh, theology, they are repla this replacement uh, theology. Uh, uh, I have to emphasize once again that Ms. Ante Jacqueline is not responsible for this replacement theology. It's Kogi Hammar, one her, of her predecessors who actually brought this New way of looking at the Bible into the Swedish church is just logic. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm not surprised. I'm just disappointed. I'm glad that I left the Swedish church so I don't have to defend it. Because I think it's, well, unspeakable. You know, also, um, I recently made a uh, video where we called the hybrid nature of terrorism in which we responded to a lot of criticism, particularly also including that coming from the Swedish government about the Israeli defense ministry and the Israeli government designating six so-called Palestinian human rights NGOs as, as terror organization. 
it's a detailed uh, video and I would uh, advise our viewers to go on YouTube and look for the hybrid nature of uh, terrorism that I produced together with a guest, uh, Maurice Hirsch, which we gave in great detail the intricate links between NGOs that have been funded by both Swedish government, Swedish charity organizations, things like this that are deeply embedded with the Palestinian Front of the Liberation of Palestine uh, as one desig internationally designated terror organization. Um, why I come onto this is because I understand you have sort of intelligence and information about funding given to Palestinians, maybe Palestinian uh, in the name of human rights uh, uh, causes, but actually going towards terrorism. I think you could maybe talk about Islamic relief and perhaps the Muslim aid and things like this that are operating within Sweden. Uh, that, that's a big problem. We, we have, uh, uh, I mean, Sweden is known for its very, very generous uh, uh, founding of uh, civil society. And uh, uh, and uh, the foreign aid, uh, or the whole foreign aid uh, complex, and uh, over the years, mainly under uh, Miss Karin Jemtin, she's now head of the, the Swedish authority, uh, aid uh, foreign aid authority. So uh, the, uh, this is a, actually, I I would say it's a, it's a new direction for the Swedish foreign aid where. Uh, uh, Sweden has replaced uh, much of what the Red Crescent uh, actually uh, did in terms of foreign aid or, or uh, uh, the supporting catastrophes and stuff like that. Uh, and now, now uh, the Swedish foreign aid, uh, aid agency, they, they uh, say that they are relying on the Islamic relief, Islamic relief worldwide and Islamic relief Sweden. And Islamic relief is, as we all know, uh, a part of, of the cluster of uh, Muslim Brotherhood through uh, personal unions and, and uh, other things. And Sweden has a really, really big or large impact uh, on uh, Islamic relief uh, because Sweden is one of the largest and most important uh, um, uh, cash providers for Islamic relief. And that's why we have uh, the former head of uh, uh, head of Islamic Relief worldwide was uh, Lamia Misa Lamia El Amri. She had to resign uh, for for be, uh, for enabling anti-Semitic uh, anti opinions within the organization. But the day after she resigned from the from the chair, she 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 uh, was reappointed as vice chair. And she's also heading the Swedish organization, Islamic Relief. And they are uh, actually, uh, with Swedish uh, tax money, so they, they are funding uh, Islamic Relief worldwide with some, more, say, more or less between three, uh, well, uh, 30 or 50 million dollars, US dollars uh, per annum. And it's increasing. Uh, so it is a big problem. And, what we have seen in Islamic Relief and the, the other organizations within the Muslim Brotherhood cluster in Sweden, we have seen how, how uh, um, individuals that they kind of move from uh, this cluster and they move directly into the Islamic State uh, terrorist organization. I, uh, you know, I have to tell you, I come out of this uh, conversation with you. Um, Quite content that you and I are singing from the same uh, song sheet. Um, I, I identify completely with uh, with your point of view. I'm very happy to hear that because I thought we would have uh, issues of uh, uh, differences of opinion here, but I don't find any at all. I think uh, you and I have to find a way in which we educate the Swedish people about the misuse of their tax money going into, they think, uh, uh, Palestinian NGOs where their money is being channeled uh, specifically to uh, non-legitimate uh, uh, causes, including uh, propaganda incitement of their children and women, and also uh, into actually directly going into the coffers of a internationally designated terror organization. I think we have a lot of work that we can combine on there. 
Uh, is there anything that you want to add or you want our listeners or viewers to know about before we wrap up? Uh, well, uh, the big problem actually today uh, where I and some scholars or researchers uh, we, we are starting uh, in for is that uh, all this financing and, and uh, uh, how government funding uh, or government money or my money, my tax money actually is funding this kind of uh, organization. And it's really, really hard to, to describe because everything is now covered under the umbrella of uh, uh, foreign aid. And foreign aid, uh, according to most legislations, actually is a part of the, every nation's or every state's foreign policy, and is uh, therefore uh, guarded by by uh, a lot of, I mean, a lot of regulation. You, I'm not allowed to have all the information, all account information. So, so what I would like, I know you have qualified readers, that on a personal level, I would need actually every help, how, how to track the money and track the funding, actually. Uh, in order just to, to be able to, to limit it in the future. So, so I'm actually asking for help, for your viewers' help to, to track it. And, uh, I'm limited within Sweden, but if you, or if you guys find anything in your home country, in Israel, or, or, or uh, in neighboring countries or other Western countries, uh, please contact me. I would be most glad to have all the information I, I can get right now. I think I think one way that we could make this work, Johan, is that if you over there in Sweden can create an NGO for a financial accountability for the charity money or government money going into, for instance, as we said, Palestinian NGOs is one, that we over here in Israel, through the work done over here, by organizations called uh, NGO Monitor, by Palestine Media Watch, by my organization, Israel Institute of Strategic Studies, we can give you the accounting of where that money is being used for and where it's disappearing into. And you will be horrified to find out how much of your Swedish uh, citizens' money are going directly into the coffers of, again, I repeat, an internationally designated terror organization. And I think we need an organization over there in Sweden, perhaps headed by you, in, in, in order to bring the facts and figures to your accountability, to your government uh, uh, departments and uh, representatives over there and even create maybe a grassroots movement of Swedes demanding to know that their money is going legitimately to proper uh, human rights or whatever needs is, is required over here and not disappearing down a rabbit hole uh, under the uh, under, uh, visible title of Palestinian uh, Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Um, I think that's one way we can work together. Um, my other thing before thanking you, uh, Johan, is I want you to let me know as soon as your book has an English uh, translation, and I'll be very happy to have you on another show to talk about it. Well, thank you, Barry. Thank you very much. Uh, and I will, again, uh, Johan Westerholm, Thank you very much for joining me and viewers. If you're watching this video, I ask you to do one thing. Please go to the uh, button on YouTube, subscribe, because if we get minimum of 100 people pressing the subscribe button for free, it means that we can make our uh, video link uh, have its own specific title, The View From Israel. Uh, and we need, according to you, YouTube uh, rules and regulations, an, a number of 100, minimum 100 people pressing the subscribe button. It's free to do so. And please also share this video that we're making here today. Thank you for joining me. This is Barry Shaw from The View from Israel.